Smart Business. And it's going to be moderated by Erika Grisan. And what's really interesting about her is that her passion lies in innovation and digitization predominantly in the in insurance field. So insurance is close to her heart. She's the managing director of Insurance Factory Innovation Store. And she has also uh, founded INTA, which is an industry talent network and innovation education program for young talents. And her motto, which I think is very fitting to today's event, is curiosity drives innovation. So I'm curious about the session. Please come to this, welcome to the stage, Erika. Thank you. <laughs> yes, innovation is my passion. And I am very happy to moderate today a very interesting panel discussion. Smart AI leads to smart business. But the big question, how, how do we do it? What is smart? What is AI? And I don't know the technique. I am not a technique guy. And I invited Mario Tuta, who knows everything about AI. He knows what does it mean, data science, data analytic, performance marketing, a lot of experience in this field, and I am very happy to know more about it. He was by Swarovski. He knows everything about Swarovski data analytic and performance marketing. And of course, he getting now a certificate for bean keeping. I'm so very happy to know more about your secret. How what does it mean AI? What does it mean smart AI? And after that, we will discuss with Hannes von Avias as well about the topic, what's going on? How can we lead a digital future for companies, for SMEs? What do we need to do for it? Mario, stage is yours. Thank you. So first of all, I have to clarify, I don't know everything. <laughs> I'm not the Oracle of Delphi, so, um, but I'm really pumped to be here. I'm excited because I'm in a room with loads of business leaders and technology enthusiasts like you, who know that technology will enable, enable us to grow and prosper, not only for yourselves, but also for your businesses, your friends and colleagues. I'm excited because I'm in a room with loads of people who breathe technology and who know Networking is not only about taking, it's also about giving. But most important factor is that you get inspired today. Inspired from the word inspirare from Latin means breathe in. So lean back today and breathe in about all the information you will hear today. So this is me in the year 2019. I was working for Swarovski as a team lead for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. And we have just launched or implemented their multi-cloud multi data lake uh, in the first year. And in the second year, we went live with multiple uh, lighthouse projects like this one, which you see in the back, uh, which is an image recognition project where we tried to identify Swarovski crystals on a table. Besides that, we had also other projects like text mining, uh, where we tried to uh, build up a catalog for Swarovski for customer service, so if people send us emails that we ca can identify the question in the emails. And the third one was we used image recognition also for the manufacturing process to sort out defect articles. And the final one is basically predictive maintenance. That's the classical one, although this one failed. So, and Swarovski sent me to numerous conferences within the European Union. I went to Berlin, I went to Frankfurt, I went to Vienna, and everywhere I saw the same picture. I saw really huge enterprises like Swarovski, Agerholz, uh, Wiener Linien, for example. And the funny thing is, if you go to those kind of conferences, in 95% of the cases, you always meet the same people. And I was wondering, why is this happening? So in the third year, Again, I met all the, the same people, the same presentations, and I wondered what's happening on this market. So in 2020, I decided to take this to my mission. So I was wondering, why do only big companies invest into AI? And what's about the rest? So where is everybody else? Why is nobody here? 
So therefore, we have first of all to clarify what are SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises. And if you follow the classification of, about the European Commission, you will find we have micro-enterprises, typically with less than 10 people, we have medium-sized enterprises, and we have small-sized enterprises. And normally you would differentiate then those between the number of employees and the turnover. The thing is now you would say, okay, why do I even care about small and medium-sized enterprises? Well, if you have a look at the statistics here, it's kind of mind-blowing mind that we have 99.6% of all companies in Austria are SMEs. We have in total approximately 358,000 companies in that area with more than 2 million people and an tur uh, annual turnover of 497 billion euros. So there is people, there is money, but obviously there is no AI. Why is that? So, and I was really thinking hard, how can I explain you this? So if you're not a business owner, it's kind of hard to understand. And I thought, I take a side journey, uh, and one of the old uh, favorite topics my grandfather did, he told me stories, so I want to tell you a story today. And the story is about Greek mythology. So this is an inspiration for Greek mythology. So maybe some of new, you know already the story, but there's a famous story about Odin and Mimir. So Odin, the great father of all gods, sitting on his throne, by the way, I did this with Midjourney, um, is sitting on his throne and he's watching the tree of the worlds. And, he's, and the tree of worlds connects all the uh, different worlds in, in, in heaven. Odin is listening to everything what's happening and he hear, hears some noise, some whispering, some rumbling about the doom, something uncertain is going to happen and he doesn't know what to do. So he decides, okay, what can I do? That's kind of an odd situation. And even if he had, he had already some runes, but they didn't help, help him to see into the future. So with, what did Odin do? He did some research, as every data scientist would do. He dig into uh, some stories and he found out that there is, a human, uh, there is a being called Mimir, and Mimir is living at the roots of the world of trees. And he's sipping from a, a sea or a well of wisdom, so every day he drinks wisdom, and Odin got really jealous about it, so he said, okay, that's, that's not good. I'm the, the god of all gods, so sh I should drink the, from the world of wisdom, but not this guy. So he basically put himself in a sloppy hat, a uh, very, very old outfit, and would, said, okay, I, I'm going to go to the world of giants. And the giants are the enemies of the gods, so that, that's why he uh, went undercover. So he arrives at Juntenheim, basically to meet Mimir, and then he arrives at the house of Mimir, and he basically says, who approaches my abode? And Odin loses, loses his patience and says, it's me, I'm Odin, chief of the gods, and I want to partake of the well of wisdom. And then Mimir tells him, look, I know that, because I drank from the well of wisdom, but this comes with a very high price. And then Odin says, okay, I've, I will pay any price, no matter what. And then Mimir says, okay, then you have to pluck out your, ear, uh, your eye. Okay, he already said I would pay anything, so he plucked out his eye and threw it in the well. And Mimir acknowledged his uh, sacrifice and basically gave him a horn full of water from the well of wisdom and Odin drank it in one sip. And with that, Odin became the most powerful creature in Norse mythology. So he basically suddenly could see, see in the future, he could see what he can change, and he could see what he couldn't change. So does this sound somehow familiar? I have this quote from Jody Peterson, which basically says, data is the language of the power holders, and all of you are power holders. It's up to you if you take the scepter in your hands and if you start your journey into artificial intelligence or not. From my point of view, this is a very good comparison to small and medium-sized business uh, leaders dealing with artificial intelligence because basically the well of wisdom is artificial intelligence. Um, but to use it, you have to do a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is, first of all, you have to invest time, you have to invest money, and you have to invest resources. And with that, you can profit from artificial intelligence. But in the end, this also comes with a price. So Odin lost, uh, lost his eye and he could not go back to the initial state. And exactly the same is for small and medium-sized business owners. You cannot go back. 
So as, 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 as soon as you start this journey, you will have to con continue it to profit from it. So you have to be aware of the risks, but if you invest wisely, you can basically see into the future and profit from it. So what are now the main reasons why SMEs don't invest into artificial in intelligence? And there is a very good study from the Chamber of Commerce in Austria, which was conducted between the year 2017 and 2019. And what you will find is there are three main barriers why companies do not invest. So the first one is GDPR. So everybody of you knows GDPR, right? No, nobody does it. <laughs> exactly. I spent three years at Swarovski uh, digging into GDPR because we had so many uh, cases where we had to deal with it. But this is a common topic for all enterprises. So it doesn't m matter how many employees you have. It doesn't matter how big you are. You have to deal with the topic and the legal issues about it. But the other two topics, first of all, knowledge, and the second one, uh, costs. So how do, you do, how do you deal with that? So first of all, you could learn coding. Who of you can code here? Okay, so that's good. It's more than I expected. So that's the first thing you could do, right? You could sit yourself in front of a computer. There are great resources to learn coding nowadays. My top one uh, recommendation is Kaggle.com. The second would be Python.org. And the third one, of course, YouTube. But don't lose yourself in cat and uh, dog videos at YouTube. The problem here is this takes a lot of time and effort. So you have to invest a lot of time. So you will see the effects only in the mid and long term, and that's a problem, right? Then you could say, okay, I just uh, give this opportunity so to some of my employees, which would also work, but good luck finding those people because most of the programmers leave the country at the moment. And the other part is, if, if you will find the unicorn, which is called a data scientist, they will probably not work for an SME because it's really badly paid. I, I remember a conference about artificial intelligence in Berlin where basically a guy went to the stage and he said, I'm not sure, sure about all of you if you're happy with your jobs, but we have offerings. <laughs> okay, that's a bold statement. So this means the guy never even put the, put the job on LinkedIn because he got like 15 applications right on spot. So that's the problem at the moment. So what can you do next? So there is a very odd, well that's bad. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, even if we fix the first problem, you will face another problem, which is called the long tail of AI. And I will quickly explain it to you. So there are the multinational companies. You all know, know them. Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb. These companies have so many clients that they can uh, uh, generate really powerful machine learning, and algori uh, machine learning algorithms, which benefit to thousands and hundreds of thousands of users. This means the business impact is really high. Classical version would be Google Ads, Meta Ads, Pinterest Ads, LinkedIn Ads. So you have a powerful platform which serves hundreds of thousands of users, high impact. Maybe you're lucky, you're e you have an e-commerce website where you implement the product recommendation, good for you. You're also on the left because web searches, product recommendation engines, that's typical of product you can implement pretty quickly. But if you go to the right side, the problem starts. And here are typically the SMEs. The first problem is you don't have enough data. And the second problem is even if you have data, you would still don't have the capacity to do so. So that's a problem. So let's take an example, right? I take a typical sushi store. So the sushi store could now decide, okay, we have uh, like 10 subsidiaries and every one of us is starting collecting data which kind of sushi people are eating. And then you will find out, okay, the preferences about sushi are completely different. So I spent half a year in Japan. I know uh, this, the sushi taste in Japan is kind of odd because they eat sushi with mayonnaise. Every European would say, that's crazy. It's, sushi should be healthy. But then you would find out the preferences in every city, in every region, in every country are completely different. So you cannot use the same algorithm, basically. You have to do your own algorithm for every spot. Okay, that's also a problem. Nevertheless, we have to think about like this. So if a sushi, sushi store can improve the turnover by 10,000 euros per year, it's still a lot of money for the owner. It's not a lot of money for other people with big businesses, but for those guys, it's a lot of money. Oh, sorry, switching back. Good. And I brought you a few examples how SMEs can still implement projects like this. So the first solution you can do is get some experts in a domain, 
ideally data science students, because they have to do so, <laughs> and make a project like this. So this is one of my clients. It's a print shop. This print shop has an online store. It's an e-commerce platform, and you will find out they have thousands and thousands of products. So you can order greeting cards. You can order uh, cards for babies and children, stuff like that. The problem is you don't really know what people are searching for. They also have wedding articles. So what did we do? We basically tried to, found out to find a prediction for all the products they have, which looked like this. So we had one product net, and then we did a forecast. The problem of this owner was he has a very small uh, warehouse, and he really needs to know when to put what on stock. So the whole purpose of this project was to have a prediction for each product and then to know what should he order when. It was quite successful because we could predict at least the top 20 articles here. The second one, my recommendation here is always start small. If you start small, you can fail cheap. If you start big, you can fail very expensive, like Volkswagen, for example, in Germany. So I always take the quote from Samuel Beckett, ever try it, ever fail, no matter try again and fail again, but fail better. Second one, there are really powerful machine learning platforms uh, coming up right now. So one of them is Google AutoML. Google AutoML basically enables you that you do, you do your own models. So here, for example, for pictures or videos, you can upload your own pictures, your own videos, and you do the classification by yourself. Then Google takes over, basically renders thousands of algorithms and gives the best uh, back to you, which basically means you can then upload your own photos and make a prediction on those photos, like here, for example, um, for strawberry. Here, it works really bad because it says uh, 0 0.946, it's an apple. So you have to improve this model, right? <laughs> and if you have a look at the market, currently thousands of those platforms are coming up. Um, the only problem is you need a little bit of technical expertise here. But I think in the midterm, these will get really easy in usefulness and ease of use. So pretty much anybody can use those platforms. The, the downside is you will never see which kind of algorithm worked for you. So it's a black box. You shoot the data in, and the stuff comes out. But what happens inside is a black box for you. Still, for small businesses, this is an added value. Then I took another example from Tokyo, because uh, I, I ate loads of ramen in Tokyo. And the problem in Tokyo is, so you have this chain. It's one of the most famous uh, ramen chains in Tokyo. And the thing is, there are over 40 stores in, alone in, in Tokyo. At some point, you, you lose um, track sh uh, traction where you have been. And one guy from Tokyo said, OK, that's my data science project for my, for my studies. And basically, he made an algorithm which detects, based on the, on the cups, on the ramen uh, cups, to which store they belong. So who sees any difference in those cups? Exactly. But there is a difference. So the image recognition can determine the difference between those three cups, although you can't really see it with your eye. And then another example from London. So this guy, basically a butcher shop owner, said, what the heck? Artificial intelligence is nothing for me. What should I do with it? But his problem was right beside him, a new supermarket opened, and they offered really cheap meat. So he said, OK, I have to do something. And he basically what he did, uh, was purchasing a, Jesus, uh, purchasing a very small device, by the way, which we also used for Swarovski. It looks like this. It costs, costs you 100 bucks, and it tracks every mobile phone that passes this device. So you know if people went in, into your store or if they passed your store. So it's basically like a counter. It counts how many people went into the store and how many people passed. And now he said, okay, every day I put up a new sign in the morning, and the question is, do people react to this sign? He's, he just made a photo of the sign, and then he was looking if it, if it made any difference in the behavior of people, and it actually did. So this is a very simple use case. Uh, you will also get a dashboard like this. So on testable mobile phones, you can check how is the traffic currently today, but you will also get a comparison per day, per week, per month. And this is really useful. And the next topic I want to show you is from tourism. So actually, I come from Tyrol. Skiing is a big issue there. And we just introduced dynamic pricing there. Who has heard, heard of it so far? Shi Amade also introduced it. Yeah, so basically, what does it mean? 
So for all online ticket sales, they have a dynamic pricing model running. This means the price per ticket is not fixed anymore. The earlier you book, the cheaper the ticket is. And here you can see you can basically get 20% off in certain or over Google uh, to go skiing. The problem is the later you come, the more expensive it gets. And these prices are from last year, so we, you will be shocked this year the prices are even more expensive. But basically, they had an uplift in turnover by 15% just by presenting this. And the funny story is, uh, first of all, they found out students would never pay 50 euros for a, a skiing ticket. That's why they get cheaper tickets for students. And the other way around, if you're a CEO of a successful company and you have hardly any time left, you don't really care how much the ticket is. You just want to go skiing. And your most important factor is that you can park your car right in front of the uh, slope, right? And they even charge you for that now. <laughs> but the interesting thing is you can basically uh, invest into both target groups. So you can invest in students and y the CEOs and everybody's happy because they have the tickets for their own price. And by the way, Flixbus will also introduce this model. I just talked to the CFO, CFO. They have a large IPO coming up. So they will do exactly the same. The tickets from Munich Airport, for example, uh, will have a dynamic price. Even the seat reservings will have a dynamic price. So it's going to be interesting how this impacts the industry. So this is my final statement. Basically, it's up to you if you want to take the scepter of Odin and drink for his horn and the dwell of wisdom. I wish you great luck with it. And now I think we proceed with the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario, for your insights. I would hear this use case, I think, till midnight. Are you agree? Would you? Who would you hear more and more use cases? Hey, who would hear? Yes, I think so. This is uh, very interesting because how can we use the technology? This is the main question because the technology is here, the technology will develop, but the question, what does it mean for companies? How can we transform? How can we use this digital transformation as business opportunity? My question to audience, do you have any question to Mario to this amazing presentation or to picture from my journey? Do you have any questions? If not the case, I have a lot, but we will not discuss alone. Uh, I would like to invite to our stage Hannes Schwetz from Austrian Funding Bank and <laughs> Federal Austrian Invest uh, Adaption. And uh, if i looking uh, for artificial intelligence, what are you doing? The first step, Google. You search in Google. And in English, artificial intelligence, if you Google, it's more than 919 million, nearly 1 billion explanation. In German language, it's less uh, 40 million. Also, we have to put a lot of uh, information in German language as well. And uh, if we want to know how can we transfer, what should we do uh, in this AI, because AI is everywhere rapidly growing. It's, uh, we don't know sometimes the technology behind it, but sometimes we know if you can, if you can uh, get a notification if we are going to a steakhouse. And in this case, I would like to discuss this very great topic, because as you know, this is my passion, innovation, and I think the most important technology now in our time is artificial intelligence. We are in the fourth revolution, industrial revolution, and of course, AI is one of the most uh, interesting. Uh, but before we starting with these hard technology issues, I would like to know, how would you explain AI for a five-year-old? Hannes, what would you say for a child, child that, hey, AI, what is this? Thank you. Uh, I think a child wouldn't mind. Right. First, I think they would see it as a vir virtual friend. It's just like someone they need. It, there's no physical manifestation, uh, but he can interact and find out if he likes it or not. It wouldn't mind if it's called AI or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm virtual friend. 
Mario, who would you explain it? I like your definition because I saw in Japan also the robot of SoftBank, which is also used for children education. But I would explain it like this. There are two forms of AI, weak AI, which basically is just uh, doing repetitive tasks for you, and strong AI, which aims to have a consciousness like we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, Hannes, you have a lot of experience, more than 20 years experience in investment uh, case. It's uh, no, I would say that uh, if we are looking for digital index, we are not in Austria the most invested uh, countries, but the five most invested countries in, uh, in artificial intelligence is uh, USA, China, Canada, UK and Israel. Uh, what do you mean, what is uh, our case in Austria? Do we have enough finance middle to do it? Do we have some statistic for us? What does it mean, AI, investment, technology? Uh, so if you look at the, the statistics, like Fraunhofer made a, a survey last year, uh, and they found out that about one third of companies don't mind about AI at all. So that's already interesting. And around 9% are actually using it. And that's not a lot, right? If you look at the numbers we just saw before from the number of SME we have, uh, there is huge potential. I would rather formulate like like this. And uh, we see, have quite an uptake in the research. And we also have since 2020 also programs from the public side which actually support these activities. But there's a lot to be done still, right? So we are in the very beginning. We have already funded plenty of projects in this field, also small companies, not only big ones. Uh, but if we compare us, like, to be honest, with uh, just Microsoft pushing 10 billions into open AI, right? That's more than European Union is investing in AI overall. So just to put things in proportion and to give another number, the states might be the biggest investor, but that's the civil investment which is there, uh, the military investments is about nine times higher. So there is a lot of research going on, and it's, uh, I think it's on us to bring it on good purpose. And we have uh, a lot of research in Austria going on on that as well, and the fun part is how can we bring it in practice for the good use of the people. Mm -hmm. And therefore we, we, we are working since, since many years uh, on that. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of to do, isn't it? But what does it mean smart AI for you, Mario? So you have a lot of uh, experience in this case. You show some of uh, use cases. But what is uh, smart AI? Well, I would differentiate between big companies and small companies. So at big companies, typically, you would have a data science team or start with a data lake, uh, no matter which uh, version you use but you have a huge investment up front. So we talk about hundreds of thousands of euros uh, with a team which has to work for you like 40 hours per week. And to be honest, at Swarovski we made some mistakes there. So we employed, for example, a physicist PhD guy and initially he couldn't work for three months because he didn't have access to any data. And that's the worst case scenario, right? Uh, but then you will also find no matter where people go, they will hear about embedded analytics or embedded AI. So you will see applications who have some sort of AI embedded. And that's what's, from my point of view, a smart uh, point of view, because if you choose the right technology for you, you can profit from it and your business can profit from it. Mm -hmm. And what is the most uh, interesting task to accomplish today AI. What do you mean, Hannes? What, what should we do? What's the step? Uh, because you mentioned, I think, of course, the people behind it is a very important task. Last year, I have every, every, every year a motto. Last year, it was uh, my big motto, people first, technology second. This year is curiosity drives innovation. But how can we use this technology? Yeah, so to start with first, because now AI is quite rather a hype topic, it's, not, it's a technology, it's no means to its end, right? So the first thing is always to think about which problem you have in a company and how you can solve it. And like also Fraunhofer Furious already said, most people in companies don't even know about their data. So let's first look at data. If you have a problem you want to tackle, secondly, try to visualize your data, but it can also give some pricing facts like we saw before for inventory stocks. If you have 
visualize it, make the next step, right? Try some simple statistics uh, and make some correlations. That might also help a lot. So data science, basic work. And if then you still have problems you can't solve, right? And y you see a business need for it, then try to jump on the AI bandwagon. And if you do that, there's plenty of technology out there. But I think there are three principles you should look at. Um, is my application legal? Well, like we all have seen uh, the law case coming up, stable diffusion, having some slight troubles with Getty images because they were trained their model switch data they had no right to, to get. So is my system legal? Second point is, uh, is it robust? Is it technically robust? Does it re present similar results with similar inputs? And this is ad ethical, right? Does it discriminate people? Uh, or does it not discriminate people? Just one example. So whatever sy system you want to design, I would look at these three principles uh, before you start implementing. So legal, is it uh, robust, and is it ethical? And then technology will help you to implement and to work on those principles. But if you don't look on these three cornerstones, you're, you will not apply it very smart, and it might very, very negatively impact your future of your business. And by the way, these three things together, they are called trust versus CII, defined also by the European Union. So I think that's one side if you want to be smart uh, and think about those principles before you jump on the, the technology. That's fun. Yeah, we all try, like to play around with it. But that's just a tool, right? And look at those principles first. So that's one thing I would look really before in going into any kind of AI project. And there's easy stuff to read outside. If you look, just make a, a, sort, uh, a search, look for the LTI checklist from the a uh, high-level working group from the European Union. There's a checklist you can go through. Well, there's nothing fancy, uh, nothing difficult. It just makes sure if you use systems like this, you, you follow these three principles. And that will help you a lot in the implementation, but also in growing a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. Mario, you mentioned that uh, we have in Austria more than 99% uh, SMEs. Do you mean is the first step really for our um, landscape that uh, to check the legal point of view for our data or AI strategy? I always find it amusing because if you have the discussions in Europe, the first question is uh, data security. If you talk to an American guy, the situation is completely different. They just, they just say, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's deal with the other stuff later. So that's one barrier we have to f face with because everybody's so afraid of the legal impact here. So from my point of view, the legal impact is not really the case because at Swarovski we also d discussed a whole year about legal impacts, but in the end we found basically three data sets which were kind of uh, a problem, but the rest was completely fine. So uh, it's important to take the concerns of everybody, especially if you work in corporations, please take it seriously, pick up all the questions they have, but also answer them, and if you, if you do a check mark under that, you can proceed. I mean, that's, you can do it as a first exercise, but then proceed. Uh, people will all, always ask stupid questions uh, and you will never get reach your goal. So that's my, my advice here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, the data is the new Earl. Also it means that uh, we have to work with data. But uh, how can we transform our companies to a data-driven, AI-powered company? What, do we, what should we do in this case, Mario? Well, from my point of view, it all depends on the CEO. So I, I saw various companies implementing uh, data lakes, uh, analytics platforms, and the problem is if it's a bottom-up uh, approach, so people are convinced that it's an added value for the company, uh, it's a problem because you have to prove your CEO uh, that there's a return on investment, and that's really hard, especially in the beginning. Um, if you have a really good CEO, so the CEO should be data-driven, he should formulate a vision for the company, even if it's a very long-term vision, like 10 years, 15 years but you know to which goal are you working towards to, uh, and I think that's a very huge success factor. Most companies, successful companies I know, the data science team is directly reporting to the CEO and not uh, basically lost in some division. Mm. As I see, we have a lot of incremental innovation, modernization, uh, some process it will be 
improved, it will be new product developed, but the really transformation, the really disruptive uh, idea, I think uh, here in Middle Europe I, I'm missing, as we, we don't have enough unicorn, we don't have, uh, but but we have some middle, as of from your side, Hannes, you, you support, you uh, check the investment. It's really, it depends on, on this issue only that we don't have enough money, or do we have other, other point of view? Why can we not have the 10th unicorn in Austria, for example? What do you see that uh, from your investment point of view? Uh, so from the... From the unicorn point of view, I think Austria has to learn to think a bit bigger. You hardly see any startups which say actively, like in the States, I want to be a 1 billion uh, euro company. So that's rare, right? So that's still in our heads. Uh, from the public side, there's quite some support, actually. I don't know if, if the colleagues could, could come up with this slide. You would see uh, programs which we are currently providing. Uh, so there's, if you search for solution providers, there's the AI marketplace which has more than 200 providers of solutions for AI. So if you have an idea, if you have a problem you can't tackle uh, with conventional methods, look at the AI marketplace. Uh, it's not I mean, up yet. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, like we talked before with the data, yet you have to look at the data, and it should be legal. Uh, and there's a program called now AI Wissen. So it's AI knowledge. So if you're a company, and uh, you look into this topic, you can get up to 20,000 euro of cash, like for lawyers, uh, and you can also get 20 hours of consulting from, from our colleagues from the IP department, which help you to look up and to build a strategy for your data, because you cannot become a unicorn if at the end of the day you find out the data does not belong to you, right? So you have to really think about this from the very beginning. And then for sure, as, we, as you mentioned before, the SMEs are, are just in the beginning, of adoption, uh, adopting the technology, and that's okay, I think, right? So the tools have to be so easy to use and so comfortable that they don't have to think about more than use a standard uh, PowerPoint presentation, right? And there we are not there yet, but we're going there, I think, and therefore if you want to try out as a as SME, your first AI project, you can now apply until the end of the month uh, for a grant, right? Just to help you reduce this, this first burden the first cost you have in applying a project. It will not bring you to an end, but it will help you to start, right? You can apply now, uh, 15,000 euros uh, is available there. And if you're already more advanced, so you're not yet a unicorn, <laughs> but maybe you have the idea and you want to produce a new service, a new solution, thanks to AI, we can go up to 150,000, right? So that does not make you a multi-billion co uh, dollar company yet, but it can help you in the direction. And if you look around the European landscape, so for the high-tech uh, uh, subsidy grant programs from the States, I think we are rather well positioned. If you look at the AWS seed program, uh, you can get up to 800,000 euros, which requires groundbreaking technologies. But from, from an international point of view, that's what a big support there. I think in Austria we need still a bit our mindset to change. Yeah? It's not always that we have to break these things from the beginning and fix it after because we don't necessarily have the VC money to pay the lawyers afterwards. Uh, so I think it's good to cautiously look at the beginning. Uh, but the money I, I think is there. It's the mindset that we want to create these international companies which has still some progress to be, to be achieved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It gives opportunity and, of course, uh, the knowledge and the mindset. I think uh, one of the most important things not to uh, not to say, oh, it is too high risk and so try and error. As you mentioned, I think in uh, Middle Europe we have uh, really this mindset not uh, not in this room. As uh, you are everybody here in this room that want to learn, want to do something, want to use AI. Uh, but uh, most of the people, if you ask, uh, hey, you should use uh, online banking and so, and some of my friends, I have discussion every day, oh, why should I do it? Somebody can uh, steal uh, my data. 
and really that uh, this um, this mindset that we are currently now. And there's a lot of to do, uh, but uh, as um, uh, last words or, or statement, uh, Mario, what do you mean, what should we do in a SME? What should we do exactly to use the technology to transform, to lead to business opportunity, to smart business? Because, of course, technology is one part, but we need to do the business. And my point of view, if you have, if you solve a problem with this technology, uh, this is a great opportunity to grow. But what does it mean for you, smart business, and what should we do exactly if everybody going at home, and I would like to use AI, what should we do? Well, from my point of view, it's not fishing in the big blue ocean, so you would not sit there and waiting a fish to catch your cheese uh, piece. But if you're a business owner, normally you have a gut feeling. First of all, what are repetitive tasks in my company I want to get rid of that my people can focus on more interesting work? And the second one, you have a gut feeling about analytics projects which might be interesting, and that's exactly where you should dig into. So your, your gut feeling normally tells you already a pretty sophisticated story, or the employees around you. Many of those have very good ideas, and maybe it's just a matter of collecting them and then just digging into it, and then choosing the technology how to, to realize it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hannes, do you have a statement for us? Because uh, in my research now for this meeting, uh, in San Francisco is no... Uh, in museum uh, sentence, sorry for killing the most of humanity. And I don't like this sentence because I think we should use AI. You, they should help us in everyday work, everyday life. And from your side, you show us a lot of uh, possibilities. But what is your motivation to, to do and use AI uh, from your point of view? I think it's a fascinating technology. I mean, not only I like science fiction, so Asimov uh, was one of my foundations on that. And we know to breaking these three laws of Asimov has been a very interesting thought experiment. Uh, I think we will live together and collaborate, like Gerrit Stocker said from Ars Electronica. It's a question, not a question uh, if we will live together with robots, um, like a, the human manifestation, but how, right? And I think we as a human society, we can form how we can live together. We can, when we use the technology, because as a technology is neutral, I think we should implement the principles how we use it, like trustworthiness, right? Think about it, how we use the technology. And on the other side, and that's also something I think smart businesses should also consider, is to what's going on at, in the moment in Europe and internationally in terms of regulation. I know it's boring, right? it's costly. I, I also just made a recent survey and companies fear that certification processes will cost them like 100 to 300,000 euros per company. But there is a big wave of regulation building up with uh, the European Union AI Act at the center and there are standards and norms coming up. So if you want a smart business, you have an idea you want to tackle with AI and your implementation will probably last one, two years, right? then you should know that in this time frame there will be quite some regulation coming up and that you should start now to prepare for that as you are a responsible and smart and ahead thinking uh, company owner. And then I think at this stage, if we have mastered how we can deal with AI, it will be a very nice productive uh, world where we live together and we use AI systems to, to make our daily tasks easier and maybe sometimes also get inspired because like with little children, they will come up with ideas, consciousness or not, we will not know, but they will come up with ideas which might, uh, might again inspire our work. So I think it more like a companionship and we will both have our places, but we, we need a careful use of the technology and that's our responsibility and we must also have to implement the regulations which are coming up, mm -hmm. which is very interesting to do. Thank you so much. We have some minutes more. Do you have any questions? Do you want to know more? How can you lead your business to a smart business? What do you need? Um, 
Um, thank you so much for this fascinating panel. I just wanted to know, Mario, from you working with different SMEs, um, with whom exactly in the, these companies were you working with? Was it usually the CEO or was it more the CTO? And, and how was this dynamic? Because it's also a journey, I guess, that you know you go through with those SMEs. So I'm just wondering if you can share a bit on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I see two uh, versions. So the first one, normally IT department tackles me. So they get requests from the business and don't really know how to solve it. So that's the first one. Or you have a domain expert. So in many companies, I see digitalization departments popping up right now, even in either in marketing, e-commerce, production facilities, and they have challenges on the business side. Um, so these are the two ways. The CEOs normally don't talk to me, uh, except we have the final approval for the project. So we say, okay, that's not the investment cost we have to face. Is it a yes or is it a no? And that's mainly the purple, uh, point where I talk to a CEO. But before that, except I would say in tourism, because in tourism we have so many enterprises below 10 employees. And in these cases, you would basically meet the whole team at, at once. But medium size, normally not. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, Mario. Thank you, Hannes, for your great insights. I wish that we here in Austria, we have uh, in the next five years, minimum one unicorn. Who wants, who wish it? Please, uh, hands up. Yes, we want to have. Today is a great uh, place to, to innovate, to inspire. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention and see you later. Thank you. Thank you.